Today is a day when many men are struggling. How do we help them? Welcome to the podcast. My name is Owen Strand. This is Grace and Truth with Owen Strand, and I am joined in the studio in California today by Pastor Mike Fabares. He's the senior pastor of Compass Bible Church, and he's the voice of Focal Point Radio, heard all across America and even beyond. Thank you for being here. Hey, it's great to be here, Owen. It is such a delight to have you for this conversation on manhood. You have written the book a few years ago called Raising Men, Not Boys, an excellent book. And I just want to talk with you in a wide-ranging conversation about manhood. Yeah, let's talk about it. What are you seeing today as you survey the rising generation of young men? What are you seeing positively and what are you seeing that concerns you just at the overview level? Yeah, well, positively, I guess we have a lot of potential right in the fact that we have just we have people that are you know at their disposal is a vari- they have a variety of of tools and i mean think about information right? i think about a young pastor or a young person coming into an educational institution i mean they have at their fingertips the world's knowledge right I, I, you don't have to be all that good at it even to find things that you need to employ in any situation I'm sure you're like me. As a matter of fact, we've talked quite a bit through the years. Uh, you know, if I fix something in my home, I can go right to YouTube. And I can learn how to grout my shower or, you know, route out the plumbing or whatever. I totally. fixed my air conditioning the other day. I didn't wow. do it very well on the first go. But, you know, that, that, there's some great potential that we have. And I do think there's a curiosity about a lot of young people that I, I think is great men are uh, – you know, they're learners at least. Uh, and, and you know, I, I say at least because I, I do think the problem is just so systemic mm. of most young men, and this goes for women as well, uh, just th- there is this sense of entitlement that so many have. Mm. There's a weakness, I think, in character. Uh, there is a, uh, you know, a pandering to uh, a kind of, you know, give me and serve me generation that uh, at some point we can't sustain it. I mean, we, we could be prophetic, I guess, and think about, you know, what's coming as we prognosticate about the future. But, you know, we have a, a generation that, uh, you know, as we've talked about at other times, they, there's, their, their victim status is just, it, it's pulsating. You know, they want to see themselves as demanding the next thing and they are victimized and we've got to fix this somehow by having someone do something for me. Mm-hmm. You see this with the the student loan forgiveness thing, right? Mm. You know, I think about people demanding this and, and they're, they're, they're the vitriol about it. And I'm thinking, okay, loans just as a concept, right? I will borrow this money. I will pay it back. Here are the terms. I'll sign the papers. And and and, and it's it's a it's a crazy thing mm. to say. Well, it's hard for me to pay it back. So you know, forgive it. That kind of mentality about trying to serve up stuff for me is a great idealized concept, I suppose. If we didn't live after Genesis three, right? We we live after the fall, right? The the world is filled with thorns and thistles, and uh, by the sweat of your brow, you're going to make your 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 bread, and you're going to eat your bread. And and that's part of what's missing. And I think in the manhood discussion gets back to men need to be manly enough to have a man type work ethic Mm -hmm. that says, I'm going to plow through the problems. Uh, These are my problems to solve. This is my challenge to conquer. And we just need, we need some strength in men uh, to conquer what uh, is, is set before them, not like who's going to give me a handout. And part of this is, unfortunately, we live in a world where most of us have never tilled the ground for our food, mm. right? I mean, we've never had to figure out, you know, where to use the restroom or where to sleep because it's all been provided for us from the from day one. We have, you know, uh, plumbing. We have we have everything we need, right? But a, a pantry full of food. Uh, we don't know what it's like in most cases to really fend for ourselves. And yet the world is not going to be denied in the sense that it's going to force us in other areas, if not for food and, and, and waste products in the bathroom, that we're going to have to fend for ourselves in life. And so what men, young men need, I think, is a, a strength, a dominance to say, I will exercise dominion in my corner of the world and I will get things done for good, uh, not just for myself, although it starts there, everyone's got to earn their own bread, Mm -hmm. but then I've got to uh, have a manly concern to care for others. And that 
used to happen by people in their early 20s getting married and having children, and they immediately were forced right, to be able to care for a little tribe around them. And uh, men understood that responsibility and accepted it gladly. Pushing marriage back later and later and later uh, is another thing that just prevents that opportunity for them to exercise manhood and leadership and provision and protection and cultivation of a, of a, of a small economy and a household. Mm. And I just think we need, we need more of that. We need people to conquer that, to want to conquer that. And uh, that's why I want people to want marriage. I want people to want kids. I want people to want jobs. I want people to want work and challenges and, and conquering those challenges. So I think that's what's needed. And I get back to what's the advantage. I guess we got a lot of tools. We, we could conceivably steer a lot of the things we carry around in our pocket to, uh, to do good things in exercising dominion, conquering, providing, protecting, nourishing, caring for others, and providing for myself. Mm-hmm. The ancient Greeks and Romans had a condition they called asadia, listlessness, basically loosely translated, asadia. And it was a condition that would be, I guess, akin to a modern form of depression or something like this. But it's a little different. It's where you feel like you just can't even get started. You can't really get outside of your protective bubble. I sense that a lot of young men today have heard that they are toxic. And I think they're almost taking that in and taking it to heart. The American Psychological Association said in a 2019 report that here are some emblems of traditional masculinity ideology that is harmful. Being assertive, Mm. being aggressive, Mm. taking risks, being emotionally stoic. Yeah. We can both think of bad forms of everything I just mentioned, but if the Strand Fabara's Psychological Association could respond to the APA yeah. in that in that argument, assertiveness, aggressiveness are bad, basically. Yeah. What do you have to say to them if the president sits here before us? Yeah. Well, you will collapse as a society or you will have what seemingly happening in, happening in our society, there will be only one institution that says, we're in charge, we'll tell you what to do, we'll tell you where to go, we'll provide for your needs. And, you know, mm-hmm. not to merge the politics with the psychology of all this, but I mean, that that's where we're at. We've got a nanny state, mm-hmm. uh, the government is the answer. And if you look back in the history of America, that really did uh, exemplify a lot of that ability to be aggressive, provide, go after it, uh, you, you, we now are saying, well, just sit back, relax, and, and whatever you need, we'll take care of it for you. And in that sense, I don't think you're ever going to be without leadership. You're, you're never going to be without people telling you, here are the rules, here's how it should go. But in our day, it's a bunch of uh, you know liberally college-educated politicians uh, who have no clue what they're doing, but they have the purse strings. And so they're able to, uh, you know, to direct millions of dollars of funding uh, to do whatever it is they want to do, mm-hmm. right? And I just think we have to we have to recognize you cannot survive without the things that the psychological associations are calling harmful. Mm-hmm. Uh, we, 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 we have to move people off the dime and move them forward mm-hmm. or we will collapse. And uh, I think that's what we're moving toward unless something radically changes and soon. And I hope the church is at the forefront Mm -hmm. of raising up strong men Mm -hmm. who will see these things as simply more of what the world calls bad, but in fact, God calls it good. You know, light is called darkness, darkness is called light. We we need just to get back to those first five chapters of of, uh, Isaiah and say, we're living in those days. So if you say it's wrong, it's probably right. (laughs) If the culture says it's toxic, it's probably what we need. Mm -hmm. And of course, that's not true in every case, case, as you know, but we've got to get we got to get our mind uh, back into reality, which I find there's a lot of disconnect from reality because where are we without those things? Mm -hmm. What happens without that? What happens if a man or a father does not provide those kinds of of attributes and traits? Uh, We're in big trouble. Absolutely. Now, your father, if I recall, was a cop in Long Beach. That's correct. How did you first see him working? You talked about the importance of work for yeah. masculine identity, just a little, you're talking about it, weaving it through, but you mentioned that specifically a few minutes ago. I could not agree more. In fact, I, I don't quite think manhood is working, but it's inseparable from manhood. Mm-hmm. You cannot have strong manhood, biblical manhood, traditional manhood, choose it without working. How did you first learn that 
practically watching him, what was it that sticks in your mind? Yeah, well, it was amazing for me because I lived in the place where my dad actually patrolled as a police officer. Mm. So he would come home with his police motorcycle, which was very loud, driving it down the driveway, getting off of that sunburnt arms, sunburnt neck, uh, his you know aviators and his baton and gun, and he'd walk into the house fully uniformed, and you know I, that's how I saw my dad. I saw him go to work that way. I saw him come home that way. It wasn't like a lot of guys at the police department that will have a locker change, driving their you know sedan to the house. My dad parked his police bike right there in our backyard. Mm. And so we were um, clearly identified even in the neighborhood as that's where the cop lives. And uh, frankly, in my part of town, it wasn't a terrible part of town, but we plenty of times got egged, got our house egged. We were the first house on the block to put bars on the window because my dad was a police officer. They didn't like him. Uh, they called him names. And, uh, you know, that was just the cool thing to do in junior high and high school back in the day and still is today in many places. Yes. And so there wasn't a lot of respect for that. Mm. And what was interesting is to see my dad um, just as that person that early on, it was no doubt that I, 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 my dad's a police officer. I'm proud of that. It's awesome. Mm -hmm. I remember as a uh, elementary school student, my dad would come in and give the, the drug talk, mm -hmm. you know, identifying different drugs and here's what the problem with drugs. And I was so proud of my dad and this, you know, I'm a third grader. He's coming in in his police officer's uniform and all that. But by the time I'm in junior high, I'm thinking, oh, wait a minute, here's a kid that wants to beat me up because my dad gave his older brother a, a speeding ticket, you know? It's like, this was like, now I thought, okay, my dad carries a gun, my dad enforces the law, my dad's, I, I know the struggles he goes through, I see him getting off his motorcycle every night, and I'm thinking, uh, you know, this, I, I've gotta make sure that I remember this is needed, this is important, my dad is working for the good of our community, and um, I think that set me up to be a pastor because I, I always was hit with the culture I lived in said this was bad. Mm. I knew intuitively from my youth this was good. Mm. And I learned to be the odd man out. Mm. And I don't think you can be a pastor, certainly in our day, certainly in Southern California, and not just that's going to be your life. Mm -hmm. right? If I go play golf somewhere and they say, what do you do for a living? You know, you're never like excited to say, hey, I'm a pastor, right? When these guys are who knows what they are, uh, you're gonna get mocked or ridiculed. It's just, it's kind of gonna happen. Mm -hmm. um, so it was good for me, I think, to see my dad working in a job that was was maligned often, but I knew where would we be without the police in my neighborhood? When things happened and there were a few incidences where in the, in the neighborhood, things went crazy. Mm -hmm. You know, I just knew my dad, my dad knew how to solve the problem. And uh, mm -hmm. I just thought that was good for me to say, this is an indispensable role in our community. And uh, my dad works hard at it. He cares about it. He was a good cop. He did it the way I'd want men to do the job. And um, I learned to respect him because he stood up for what was right. And I never heard him say a curse word. I never heard him. I mean, just things that he wasn't a perfect man and he'll tell you that, but sure. I just, I, I, he was the good cop. Mm -hmm. And I thought, this is good. My dad said, you don't want to be a cop. He told me that from when I was a kid. Don't, don't be a cop. He'd always say, be a fireman. Do, some, do something where you're the good guy. <laughs> uh, but I, I always thought, yeah, okay, I'll listen to my dad. I, I didn't aspire to be a police officer, but I thought I respect what he does. He's mm -hmm. a hardworking man. He stands up for what's right. He enforces the law. And uh, it was so good for me and my brother to grow up under that, I think. Wow. Yeah, there's so much there. You learn how thin the line is between anarchy and order that we've taken for granted in yeah. this very comfortable society where we just assume, of course, that peace naturally flows everywhere one turns. And, and that's not really the way actually a lot of the world works, even beyond America, even sometimes in America increasingly. Yes. And so much of that line is, is policed literally by men like your father, thankfully. Uh, I remember reading still along the lines of work in the uh, Ron Chernow biography of Alexander Hamilton, a sentence. You know how sometimes a sentence yes, just grips you? I do. You don't yeah. even know why. Right. He wrote, I can still remember it. Um, Hamilton had a ferocious capacity for hard work. And that's part of why Alexander Hamilton, of course, goes on to be the Broadway play, whatever, all that, the rapping and all that sort mm -hmm. of thing. Um, Part of why he basically builds our financial system is he could roll up his sleeves and in a weekend churn out 60 pages of a financial system, basically, from mm -hmm. ex nihilo. Yeah. Amazing. Right. 
what was it in your life? You've talked about your dad's influence. What you're a you're a very hardworking man, as I know you, and one reason why I look up to you. What was it in your life that shaped you and gave you that taste for hard work? I remember my dad dropping me into a blueberry field in Maine when I was mm. twelve and going mm-hmm. rake, rake yeah. blueberries. Yeah, yeah. And I'm coming back for you in check watch. 10 hours. Yeah. I was 12. Right. It was so good for me. Mm-hmm. What What about your father? Yeah. How did he give that to you? Well, you know, my dad, and maybe it was my generation, but, you know, he was like a lot of people that were more conservative that said, my kids are going to work. Hmm. They're going to do chores. They're going to, you know, they're, they're not going to be flunkies, right? They're not going to be like what so much was happening in the 70s when I grew up. Mm-hmm. And and you saw this departure into a, the drug culture and all that. Well, you know, my dad was the one giving me those drug talks at school in the classroom. I was just like, I know no way could go that direction. Yeah. And dad said, you know, the opposite of you checking out and going the whole, you know, LSD route that everybody was was going in the rock and roll culture. It was like, you're going to be, the, the antidote to that is you working productive work and to work hard. And so I did that at home and dad wasn't one who was maniacal about me having a job. As a matter of fact, I remember going to him, I was 14 years old, I said, dad, I, I want to go get a job. Mm-hmm. And dad said, oh, be careful, you know, because once you start working, he told me you'll never stop. Hmm. So, you know, you need to be sure that this is what you're ready to do. And I remember that line stuck with me, like Hmm. you're always going to work. And then then he reminded me of this because I think he knew insightfully enough that young people wanted this job that made them, you know, feel fulfilled. You know, dad's line was uh, work is work. He said, remember that, son, work is work. Mm. Whatever you do, it's going to be hard. So if you're ready to work, just know you're probably doing that for the rest of your life. Not that particular job, but you're going to be working. Mm. And uh, it's always going to be hard, which again, I know as a, as a pastor, I say, well, that's right out of Genesis 3. It is going to be hard and mm. work is hard, but there's something of value in work. And I remember a crazy scene in my front yard where guys were drunk and there was a group of them out there and I just remember my dad wrestling them to the ground and handcuffing them and you know he was just in his plain clothes one Saturday and I, I thought okay his work is something that constructively keeps harm from happening right mm-hmm. it, it takes something chaotic and brings order to it mm-hmm. and I thought well that is really what I want to do right I, I actually like a lot of kids I just wanted more money but I thought I'd like to do something that's helpful mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, I got a job doing facilities and first I worked at a park cleaning toilets and stuff like that. But I was like, okay, I wanted to feel good like I did as a little kid weeding the yard and going to my dad and getting the three dollars or whatever he gave me for that and thinking this is job well done dad would inspect it you know even making our beds you know my dad was a military guy and you had to make your bed in a certain way and you know i just i, I felt good when i passed inspection you know that's a good a job well done so i'd go to the, my job and i would say i just want to do it well i'd like it to come out well and of course i wasn't thinking of colossians 3 i wasn't thinking about serving the lord i just was thinking like i just want to do a good job at this yeah. because we're made in the image of god uh I think that resonates whether you're a Christian or not. If you if you have a conscience that's still active, you're like, I, I want to do something productive. I want to do something when you look at it, you say, that's done well. Mm-hmm. And I guess I just was willing because I saw a good example. Uh, I was like, I just, I like that. I love that. And, and dad wasn't much for silliness. You know, I grew up in that era and, you know, we played a few games here and there, but You know, there was a lot of things that I thought, if I do this, what's going to come of this? You know, do I really want to just spend all my time on my hobbies? You know, I want to do something that makes a difference. And so when I got saved and I was raised in a church, but when I became a Christian, a genuine Christian at 18, that's when I started really saying, okay, there's things, there are things that I can do that are constructive, but how would God use me in the most constructive way? Mm. And I didn't know what it was going to be. And it was all going to be based on what God chose to gift me with and all that. But um, I, I've always had that sense because early on, dad cared about the quality of our work that I would like to work and I'd like to do something constructive and I'd like it to be good. And I want to be able to stand back and say work is a good thing. Of course, and as I learned scripture, you know, I think about Mark three, they were complaining Mary and Jesus's half brothers that he was working too much. They think he's crazy. He's out of his mind. And they're all gathered in that house and crushing in on him. And, you know, Mary and the brothers bring word in through the crowd. You know, your mother and your brothers are outside. They want to talk to you. And, and Jesus, you know, really slams them with, who are my mother and my brothers? Imagine being Mary at that point. It's like, why? Because Jesus had this 
this sense of, while mom was saying you need a vacation, mm. and that was kind hearted advice, just not the advice Jesus was gonna accept because he elsewhere would say, my father's always working, I'm, I'm working. Mm. Of course we believe in rest and that's the whole pattern of the, of the work week. Yeah. But you know, I just think that there's a quality in that. Nighttime's coming when no one can work, right? But we're gonna work while it's still day. And, and, and that picture of like, if I have opportunity to do something good and constructive, I wanna do that. And I think that's the better focus and, and I always use my dad as a little kid as my standard. Like if dad says, this is a good thing to do, paint this or weed that or, or till that or mow that lawn. And he said, that's, that's a job well done. And having a good father relationship, I, that meant a lot to me. Dad's yes. approval. Dad said, that's good. Yes. And so I wanted that. And then as an adult, of course, we'd like God's approval. We'd like to hear well done, good and faithful servant. So it, that, that is a good, I think, godly foundation from a blue collar Christian dad, who I think trained my brother and I to work for something productive. I saw it in him. I saw it in my chores. I wanted to work. I didn't wanna play as much as the other kids did because I just didn't feel the same sense of satisfaction playing a game as I did building something, constructing something, fixing something, yeah. you know? And my dad gave me a car without an engine in it when I was a kid, 15. He said, you want a car? I got a car for you, but we're gonna go in the garage every night. And we're gonna build an engine together. And so we built an engine every night. We'd go out there in the garage until late at night building a Volkswagen engine from scratch. And those are the kinds of things my dad just naturally taught me. I don't know what, there's a lot of strategy to it, yeah. but like, we're gonna work hard for hours and hours and hours, and you're gonna get something constructive out of this. You're gonna have a car to drive, you know? We didn't have a lot of money. That was probably the best economical way for him to get me a car at 16. <laughs> but those were things that were impressionable for me that I do think, um, resulted in my desire to work in a constructive way for something that makes a difference. Yeah, mm, that's powerful. I, I think there can be a lot of pressure on us men, particularly men who are in the, the years with the kids at home. You know, you've raised your boys, mm -hmm. your sons are launched and doing well, Christians in ministry, mm -hmm. praise the Lord, your daughter's sweet as can be, mm -hmm. Christian young woman. So praise the Lord, the Lord has really smiled on you and your great wife, Carlin, your efforts. And I know there was a lot of effort there. I'm in, the, I'm in those years still. And as a young father, you can feel a lot of pressure to sort of do this. You gotta do the initiation ceremony or you've mm -hmm. gotta do these devotions with him five mm -hmm. nights a week, or you've gotta take him on a hunting trip mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. 8,000 different things that you'll hear. But it strikes me in listening to even that story, it's not so much the particular program. Mm. It's a father, <laughs> hits you saying these words, it's a father connecting with his boy. Yeah. Going to a garage yeah. from eight to 10 p.m. Yeah. at night and working on an engine. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's not very fancy. No. You know? Right. But here you are talking about it, what? 40 years later. Yeah, that's right. And and so there's something to those, that, just a word of encouragement to dads listening to us. There's something to those moments, those yep. organic moments. No, that's right. Yeah, and dad was a dad who cared about, I don't know, I don't know how intentional this was about teaching us those values. Hmm. And it wasn't in a program and it wasn't in a book and it wasn't in a class. It was just in the character of doing constructive things. Mm -hmm. And dad cared, and, and maybe it's just because he was that kind of dad, but if I had a project at school, you know, um, I would say, dad, here's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to build, I remember as a kid building a uh, eclipse machine, right? And I was trying to illustrate how, you know, the moon slid in front of the sun. And so we were gonna build this thing. And dad always took that seriously, right? My dad wasn't just gonna plop in front of the, the TV, right? He was gonna take me out into the garage and we were gonna work together on this thing. And I just knew my dad got his teeth into this. This was gonna be good. Mm. And I was gonna learn. And, and I learned so many lessons just, I think in the garage mm. with my dad um, and it had nothing to do with Bible verses, even though dad cared about that. I was learning a Spurgeon's catechism 
as a kid for a nickel for every question I memorized or whatever. So he cared about my spiritual development. But those days of building a solar eclipse machine in the garage or building an engine at 15 or, you know, my dad used to reload bullets in the garage and we'd sit out there and reload bullets cool. and your dad was a shooter, you know. So, of course, he was a cop and he yeah. taught me to shoot when I was young. And just sitting out there and watching that we could take the raw materials. I would climb into the the range. This is a weird story I've never told. And, and I would dig out old shot up bullets that were just, you know, they're lead slugs. Mm. And I would bring them home and dad would put them in a melting pot. We'd melt them, we'd cast them into new bullets and we'd turn those into new bullets with casings and powder and primers. And we'd put it all together and we'd have a big, you know, ammo can full of you know, ammo and we'd go out and we, Saturday and we go shooting, cool. you know, and we lived in Long Beach. We were in a concrete suburban jungle, but we'd go to the pistol range or something, or sometimes we'd go up to the mountains and go shooting. Mm. But those experiences, and it was kind of neat that dad wasn't rich, mm. right? We, we reloaded bullets because we didn't have money to buy new bullets. Yes. And I would go hunting like a little scavenger for used slugs in the backstop of the pistol range mm. uh, because, you know, this was the economical way to, for us to get you know, bullets. So it's just a weird thing that that simple, non-rich um, approach to how can we do something that's constructive and there's always a payoff. And there always was, right? Good project for the science project, engine for my car to drive, mm. you know, bullets for us to, to shoot and have a good time on a Saturday. That Those were good experiences. And dad wasn't a trying, I think, to teach me any lessons. Yeah. He just it was involved. And I... I think I benefited greatly from that. Hmm. Yeah, this is this is really encouraging to me and and powerful I think just to think about and I pray it's it's encouraging for men listening to this and even for women listening to this. This isn't a podcast for men alone, but um, it doesn't have to be fancy stuff and no. you don't have to be a fancy man and your husband doesn't mm. have to be some fancy man. And even if he doesn't read even the manhood books that you and I write mm. or whatever, right. Right. He, if he just plugs in with his boy, mm -hmm. if he plugs in with his, with his girls even sure. in, in right. certain ways, but thinking especially fathers and sons for right now, Raising Men, Not Boys is the title of your excellent book. That will get the job done. That will go so far, yes. especially from a Christian perspective. I even remember my dad, I was not nearly as gifted uh, as I think you probably were and are at physical stuff, building stuff, but I was very sports oriented uh, per the per the 90s, 90s Americana. Mm -hmm. And uh, my dad, whenever, basically whenever I would ask him to go play catch, he would go play catch. Yeah. And, and now, Mike, I reflect on it, mm. 30, 25 years later, whatever it is, because I will come home from work and I am dog tired. Right. There's that work ethic. The last thing you want to do is the, go in the driveway, right? <laughs> what I want to do <laughs> yeah. is uh, drink some lemon yeah. tea yeah. and watch some sports highlights and, right. and crash. Right. What men typically want to do. Yeah. And, and, uh, and it's typically then when, you know, the request comes in to go shoot some baskets or throw the football right. or whatever. And, and, and I just remember my dad doing that over and over and over again. And it marked me. Yeah. So nothing fancy. Right. That's right. But real Christian fatherly love being right. shown right. in simple ways. And in my life as, as, you know, I wasn't like my dad, blue collar worker. And, you know, I didn't have a garage full of tools, but you know, my job was ministry early on. And when my boys were coming along, I, I just think when a lot of my work is solo, you know, like yours, research yep. in my study, door shut. Mm -hmm. But, you know, there are certain parts of my job where I can throw my kids in the car and we can go. Mm -hmm. Hospital visitation, mm -hmm. things like that. And, and you know, you think that works? Sure, it works. Bring your seven-year-old, your eight-year-old along. And I would bring them with me. Mm -hmm. And I think to have them see how dad tried to make a difference, even if it wasn't tactile and building something, but I'm yep. trying to help someone in a crisis. Yep. And my boys would come along, they'd sit there after listening to the guy talk about his tumor or his surgery or whatever, <laughs> and one of them would get sick and one didn't seem to mind. But um, I think pulling them along in your work, things that you can share and let them see, I think your boys are advantaged by that. Mm -hmm. And for me, mm -hmm. you know, I'm no perfect dad, but to at least not have a duplicitous view of work. Like so many dads come home at dinner and the dinner table, it's always talking about all the bad things that happen at work. Mm. Plenty of bad stuff at work. But mm. I think 
to take them along for things that really are productive. I, I always leave the hospital when I'm visiting our parishioners, you know, and I feel good about the visit just because yeah. I feel like I help them, you yes. know, I, I encourage them. I read the scripture with them. I prayed with them. I talked to them. I talked about their insurance bills and how we're going to pay them or whatever. And, and to have my kids along, my boys in particular, and to know now that both of them become pastors, I didn't direct them or force them into that, but they're doing hospital visitations now on their own. And, and, and I feel like they learned, I think, to care because my work wasn't just something to complain about at the dinner table. Mm -hmm. It was like, I think there's some good in my work. And of course, my work, and there's a lot of good in it. And I want you to see that. Come along with me. Yes. I think anybody who can bring their kids to the office at least every now and then, kind of see what they do, take them along with you. Let them see your work ethic and that you're doing it not just as something to get a paycheck, right? You're doing it because you think there's good in it, right? Your work should be honest work. It should be good work. It should be hard work. It should do some benefit for society, mm -hmm. some benefit for somebody. Uh, if it's not just a, a shady job to get money, your kids are going to learn about work. I mean, you're asking how I learned in the backyard pulling weeds. Almost everyone who's listening to this podcast or, or this this video can say, I could probably take my kid to some part of my work and it's a part I'm not complaining about at the dinner table and they can see this is good. Yes. And they can say, I want to do that. Because I did when I was a kid at school. I remember thinking, I'm tired of school like every kid, you know, I'm, I can't wait till three o'clock, the bell rings. And I'm thinking, I can't wait to be out there doing whatever I'm going to do. And I think that's a good thing. And I learned to want that mm. because it felt more active than the passivity of sitting in a classroom in high school or junior high. You know, I just, I can't wait to get out there, yeah. you know? And, and I think it's a good thing. Now, how many kids can't wait to get out there to get to work? That's just not a common thing anymore, no. right? And it started with, let's take this year to kind of go travel the world and take a year off. Like even that. It's like, I never had any interest in that. I'm going to get to doing something. Yes. And I just think there there can be a created desire in your boys in particular to want to do something. Because mm. uh, boys, I think, are uniquely designed by God to want to do something, mm -hmm. right? And and they're fidgety and they, they're mm. active and they want to run around as little toddlers and kids. And, you know, when they're 18, 19, 20, they want to do something. Mm. And I think dads have a critical role in trying to direct them to do something productive, something good, something not just to make money, mm -hmm. right? Uh, my prayer for my kids is that whatever they do, they, my two boys become pastors, I, that they'll at least make enough money where they're not just worried about, I got to make a few more dollars. I just yes. want them to, to, to do good. Yes. I want them to go out there and do good. And then by God's grace, I hope they get enough money to pay the bills and the mortgage in California. That's really hard. They don't even have any prospects of owning a house, but renting, you know, it's like mm -hmm. just pay the rent and do something constructive with your week. And I, I just think that is, that's, that's the goal and you can teach it without a book or a program. Yeah. I love that theme. I think you're right. And I think what has surfaced here as we wrap this episode uh, is actually work. We've talked about that. And then we've also talked about threaded throughout optimism. Mm -hmm. So dad talking well about his work. I think it transfers to the church. I think it transfers to the marriage. I think it transfers to the family. I remember hearing a guy at Southern Seminary say, you know, you should you should occasionally gather your your wife and your children, have them in a little square or circle and, and look them in the eye and say, this is a great family. It's, it's amazing to be part of this family. Mm. And he wasn't meaning it in a proud way, he's meaning yeah. it in a God-centered, God's right. grace kind of sure. way. But that struck me. Yeah. Because I don't think that's the way necessarily a lot of people talk today right. in general, men or women yeah. alike. We're yeah. just trying to battle through another day. Right. But um, don't underestimate, you know, the power of masculine optimism yeah. in a home. Yeah. Yeah. In raising men, not boys. No, it's good. Yeah. I think it's good. We want to do good. We want to do something productive. Yeah. And as long as we have breath and time and it's mm -hmm. still daylight, uh, so to speak, we want we want to we want to get it done. Mm. And I think to build that appetite in our next generation is to practice it in your own life. Amen. And that's an optimistic view for sure. Amen. Even though the world's bad and work is hard. And as my dad said, work is work, <laughs> but we're doing good with our work. And we should, I don't care what you do. And if your work isn't producing something good for the world or for your community, uh, if it's not doing something to restrain evil and promote what's right, you know, we're not giving people a service or a product that's helpful, well, then you should find another job. Uh, but it's not about being super fulfilled. It's about doing something constructive. That's right. 
Pastor Mike Favar is a senior pastor of Compass Bible Church in the Orange County, California. You hear him on Focal Point Radio, over 800 stations across America. He's just a very sound uh, voice, sound guide, excellent preacher. Commend his ministry to you uh, and his book that we've mentioned multiple times, Raising Men, Not Boys. Thank you so much for being on the podcast. Thank you, Owen. It's great to be here. Yeah, appreciate it.